The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 694 for Sunday, January 28th, 2018. The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. And the goal is, of course, by sharing uh, your questions, or all of those, and then uh, doing our level best to answer your questions and or solicit answers from the community. Of course, the goal is that each and every one of us learn at least five new things each and every time we get together. And ready to learn my five new things here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun. How you doing today, John F. Braun? You sound better. You you had a you had a like the post CES I'm less congested. whatever. Yeah, I'm less congested. Good. Yeah, I, I don't have navigation issues anymore. Right. That's with, good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With my ears being clogged. Right. Right. Yeah. Very disconcerting. Uh, I can only imagine. I can you can't only trust imagine. your own sensors. Who can you trust? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's weird. I can hear your, uh, I can hear your chair squeaking around. So it's, uh, yeah, I gotta, uh, I gotta get some WD 40 or re- something here. Reapply. That's right. I've been trying to find the exact spot where the squeak come from and I can't. Oh, well, maybe you need to get less exact and more general and just like bathe the entire, like fill your bathtub with WD-40 and then just put the chair in it. Dip the chair. (laughs) It's just a dip. That's right. Think of all the other things in your house that you could dip at the same time, right? I mean, this this could be very efficient, man. And, uh, and, well, I don't, I don't think it would ever be safe to stand in your bathtub again. Um, You know, certainly not with water running. I mean, I think you'd, you'd fall and like crack your head open, but. But, you know, you'd have a, uh, it would be just be a different type of bath, be a WD-40 bath. Uh, I don't know if that's a good idea, though. So maybe not. Hey, uh, we got a bunch of follow-ups from previous shows. So we're going to go through those. We've got some tips. Then we have some some topics that have been happening lately to discuss. So we might get somewhat cerebral in the middle of this one. And, uh, and of course, then we've got some questions from you and, and that sort of thing. So let's... Uh, Let's do it, John. Drew reminds us, shares with us, and uh, to be fair, to be accurate, corrects us. In the last episode, we were talking about note burner replacements, and we got uh, someone in the chat room said, use M4V gear. It works great with High Sierra. Well, it doesn't. Um, And thank you, Drew, for reminding us of this. and, And M4V gear seems to be a clone of note burner or note burner is a clone of M4V gear or they're clones of some other thing that all shares the same code base. But when you launch it, it says it's not compatible with, with high Sierra. So uh, sorry about the false alarm on that folks. We will uh, endeavor to continue searching and hopefully find something. Also in the last show, we were talking about photos and finding corrupted photos amongst a sea of folders of various things. And uh, Warren on Facebook had a great idea. He said, create a new photos library in photos on your Mac and just import all of the folders into that. Uh, In theory, photos will skip the bad ones and import the good ones. So, and then you could use something like power photos to sort through any duplicates that come in like that. seems to me like that might actually be a really good, uh, really good solution. You know what I mean? I like it. Yeah. And last I checked, did we, I don't know if we mentioned this last time, but a graphic converter is uh, usually pretty good about if it sees something amiss, it'll be like, well, I'm not quite sure what this is. If I'm going to make a guess. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. We'll put graphic converters in the, uh, in the show notes too. Um, all right. Uh, you know, also on Facebook, it came up while we're talking about different um, different pieces of software for manipulating images. I think Ian on Facebook, I don't, I don't think I prepped it for the show, so I don't have a link, but um, Ian on Facebook asked if there was any vector editing 
uh, programs that that people could recommend. I think he was using like vector works or something like that. And it was sort of end of life or whatever he was using was end of life. And he was having trouble. Um, Pixelmator is my Photoshop replacement of choice. It, not only is it less expensive, but it's uh, way more full, uh, full featured. And then of course, now there's Pixelmator pro, um, but Pixelmator, just the, the regular one as of, I think like three or four years ago has a vector mode in it call that they call vector mater and it's it, it, it completely lets you edit vector images and things like that so uh bear that in mind the next time you are you are thinking about what to do um because it's uh it's great i mean like like i use pixel mater every day i never was someone who could grok photoshop i mean i can use photoshop but it never really i don't know it never stuck with me for lack of a more specific term, but, uh, but Pixelmate are really, uh, really easy to use. And I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a genius with that thing. And, and when it comes to editing photos, I am not a genius. So very, very cool. Very cool. So, uh, okay. yeah. And using my mad Google skills. Yes, sir. Um, apparently there's something called Inkscape. What's that? It's a professional vector graphics editor for Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux. Well, cool. They're still is it, using the old terminology. Is it, um, have you used it? No. Oh, no, I just found okay. it. Okay. I just did a, I was just surfing for vector graphics programs and it's like, oh, this one seems popular. Interesting. Yeah. And it's totally free. So that's worth checking out too. Huh? Very cool. Huh. I'm curious what to, uh, I would like to see like, uh, they don't show any screenshots on their page. I'm always worried when it's like, you know, an app that's Mac and windows and Linux. It's like, okay, you know, how much like X windows is this actually going to look right? You know what I mean? Like, is it going to feel like a Mac app? And, and sometimes that doesn't matter. And sometimes it absolutely matters. And I feel like, um, with, for me editing images, like I really want something to feel like a Mac app. Um, and I think that honestly has been part of my problem with graphic converter over the years. It, 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 it's not like it feels like an app from another platform, but it, it lacks some elegance in its UX. It, it, ha it, it prioritizes features over flow. If that hmm. to me, right. I mean, there were years where I used it because it was absolutely the best thing And it. I mean, to do, it's not really an image editing app from that standpoint. It's just an image conversion app. I mean, it, it's true to its name. So yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, there you go. In Inkscape draw freely, freely, freely. Um, also in 693, as listener Neil reminds us as I'm moving things around here, um, he said uh, a few comments on the recent discussion regarding Thunder connecting a Thunderbolt external drive to an iMac with Thunderbolt two ports. I just had two quick comments to offer. Number one, you had noted that the Apple Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 adapter does not slow the data transfer rate. And this is true, as far as I know, and that the addition of the circuitry uh, to the data transfer path presumably does not have a noticeable impact on data transfer. He says, although I have seen no real world, world tests, but it, it is it is important to clarify that this adapter originally marketed by Apple as a way to connect legacy Thunderbolt 1 and Thunderbolt 2 devices to the new MacBook Pros and iMacs with Thunderbolt 3 a.k.a. USB-C connectors, does work bi-directionally and can be used to connect a Thunderbolt 3 peripheral to a Mac with an older Thunderbolt 1 or Thunderbolt 2 host port, in which case the data transfer rate is, of course, limited to the 10 or 20 gigabits per second allowed only by Thunderbolt 1 or 2, respectively. So that's a good point. I did not know that the Thunderbolt adapter, I mean, it makes sense, right? As Neil points out, but I never really thought about it being used in the other direction. So if you get some peripheral that's Thunderbolt mm. three over USB-C, Apple's Thunderbolt two to Thunderbolt three adapter will work in the middle between that and your, you know, older Thunderbolt Mac. That's pretty good. I like it. Good. Yeah. Thoughts. <clears throat> Still not on the Thunderbolt bandwagon, though I think it's close. It's 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 knocking, knock. It's knock, knock, knocking on your door. I think 
I want to try. Uh, well, we saw it at CES, but uh, OWC has some uh, Thunderbolt enclosures for. Uh, oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, it, for rain, their, uh, right? Is oh no, just talking? just for a single drive. I wouldn't waste your money. Uh, I, I mean, my feeling, uh, not that there's anything wrong with OWC specifically, just th there's no reason to pay to use a Thunderbolt interface between your Mac and a drive that's mm -hmm. never going to go faster than, uh, you yeah. know, the, you know oh, what yeah. I mean? I mean, the Thunderbolt speed is way faster than the drive speed will ever be even. But it's also it's an SSD. But. Oh, OK. So it's possible with an SSD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, OK. All right, because it's it, with an SSD, you could theoretically get something that's going to be faster than what USB three would allow. Okay, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. I'll I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, so thank you for that, Neil. And then going back one show before, uh, listener Marcus. Well, if I don't drop a timestamp, we're all going to be unhappy. Uh, says about text message forwarding that Jeff was having issues where uh, his it was not going to his iMac. He says I too have run into the occasional issues with it with that not forwarding, and the following has my has been my fix every single time. Number one, I make sure to add my Apple ID account's email address in addition to the phone number, which I typically leave as the only option, as an iMessage send in receive address. He says, you may try toggling it off and then back on again if you already have this email as an address. And then number two, quit the Messages app on my Mac, allow a minute or two, and then relaunch Messages. Typically, SMS forwarding or iMessage syncing will get the kick in the pants it needs. And then number three, go back and set your iMessage send and receive to the address or addresses you prefer once you've confirmed it's working. So thanks, Marcus. That's That, uh, that makes sense. And I, you know, I, I have a feeling... In the middle of his step two, which was the wait a minute or two to relaunch messages, I, I think there's probably some value in that. Don't just quit and relaunch it. Quit. Let it do whatever it's going to do. So much of this stuff happens with all these background services that sort of kick off and do their thing and happen in parallel and you don't really know it. So thanks, man. That's good. Any thoughts on that, John? I think you may want to also know, is that... No, okay. No, I thought that was handoff, but that's a handoff, something, something different. Right. Yeah, 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 right. It, it is ver related, I think, but, but, um, but different. Yep. Yep. All right. Anything else before we move on to the next little tip? That's not related to an nope. episode, but okay. So, Brett, uh, I, I love you, Brett, because you addressed an issue that's near and dear to my heart. And that is the brightness of phone screens at like concerts and places where at least currently it's socially acceptable to have your phone out. Like it's not socially acceptable at the moment to have your phone out at the movies, but, um, and it may or may not be socially acceptable to have your, to have your phone out at like live theater, but certainly at concerts, it seems to be socially acceptable to have your phone out. Um, and you know, like I feel like we'll, we'll sort of probably settle on something somewhere where it's like cool to take a picture here and there, maybe a short little video snippet. But when somebody becomes the official videographer in their own minds, that gets to be a little annoying. And, uh, Brett says, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, he says, I ran across an article that pointed me to another article related to astronomy that talks about using color filters on iOS to change the color of your screen. And you can add it as a trigger to your accessibility settings, too. So you can get it right from your control center. But but the place to go first is just go settings, general accessibility, and then display accommodations. And you'll see an option in there called color filters. Well, if you turn this on, uh, you can start doing different things to your color, which, uh, you know, depending on if I mean, I think it's built for people uh, in theory with with, you know, varying degrees of and varying types of color blindness. But if you go to the last option, the first option is grayscale. Uh, 
But the last option is color tint. And you can set that to be to essentially make your screen live, set its white point at whatever color you want. And it's those bright white screens that are really, really annoying. I mean, bright anything is annoying, but bright white's worse than bright other colors generally. And uh, and this was an astronomy article. So, again, same sort of thing. You don't want to pollute people's eyes with bright white light when they're in the dark. So uh, they set the hue. You get two sliders when you turn on color tint inside of color filters. One is the intensity, how much of this it's going to apply. And then the other is hue. So the the... The astronomy articles suggest cranking the intensity all the way up so that you get all of this color and then setting the hue all the way to the left, which sets it to red. And now you get when anything that's white on your screen will be red and far less um, annoying and obtrusive in the dark. So it won't affect your pictures or your videos. Your pictures or your videos will be whatever color they are. This is just how it's displayed on the screen. So do that. Mm -hmm. And then turn your brightness down if you're going to do this at it shows and, you know, things might be. Um, there you go. Yeah. Well, I remember, uh, you know, when I was uh, in band or, or on stage or something, they would typically uh, you, you put a red gel uh, over a light bulb. So over your stand light. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about that last night. And it had been a long time since I thought about that. But now all the stand lights are LED. And they're this mm -hmm. awful, you know, they're like that awful, you know, 6K, very blue um, LED light color. And it just looks terrible. It would be way better to put a gel over those. And you, there's no reason you couldn't gel an LED light. I mean, it's the you know, same concept, right? But yeah, that's got a red LED. <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But some people are probably going to be like, I need bright white. Like, no, you don't get used to it. Actually, I thought about last night in the theater. I, I was doing a theater show all weekend. And as usual, of course, reading from my uh, reading the music from my iPad. Uh, for this one, it was using the 10 and a half inch iPad Pro, which was great. And I actually thought about doing that and turning it to like a red screen as opposed to a white screen. Um, a lot of times I'll invert it entirely so that it's black on uh, or white text on black print, which is easier to see in the dark. In many cases, although when it comes to music on a staff, for whatever reason, I, I like and maybe it's just because of my, the way my brain's wired and what I'm used to. But I have a harder time reading intricate rhythms that way versus uh, black on white. I don't know why. So. But you guys used to just gel your uh, your stand lights. Is that right? Yep. Back in the days of uh, incandescent bulbs. Yeah. Just to date myself here. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a lot of lighting designers. Um, I encounter them in theater, but I'm sure it's true everywhere that that appreciate the the flexibility of LED lights, especially you know when you can have colors that change and strobing and all of that stuff. But um, but still use incandescent because uh, for for a lot of the just general lighting because it simply looks more pleasing to to at least their eyes. And I don't disagree necessarily. I just don't like it because it's hot when it is on you all night but you know whatever it's all good <laughs> any more thoughts on that one man before we move on nope okay so um this next little tip is a combination of something i received from a listener and i don't have your name i think you said it might have been jason taylor or was it jason hooper i think it was jason hooper actually on on twitter <clears throat> but um you know when you stay in i, I figured this out sort of in parallel uh, at while well, staying at the hotel for CES, they had Wi-Fi as John, you mentioned in the last show was, you know, quote unquote free. It was included, uh, but um, you had to reauthenticate with their portal once every 24 hours. It was a typical captive portal kind of thing that, that happens where you have to say, yep, I'm, I'm here. It's cool. And then, and then you were good to go. It didn't incur any other charges at this particular hotel, but otherwise, you know, very much the same thing that you see at a lot of these places. And a lot of times I would hit my 24 hour number, you know, whenever that was, which was, I think sometime in the evening every day, because that's when I first checked into my room and it would, it would take a lot of, of jiggering to finally get it to load the portal, you know, and once it loaded the portal, then of course I could click the one button I needed to click and it, you know, would let me in and everything else worked. 
And I find it finally hit me after the second day, John, that the problem is that every page that I had open in my browser, normally it would just take one of those and like, you know, redirect it to the portal, but it wasn't happening. And I realized these days, every page that I had open in my browser was SSL. Uh, you know, I was writing a lot of articles at Mac Observer. We've been SSL site wide for, you know, what going on two years now. Um, Google is SSL, like everything's SSL. And my browser was being smart and just not even letting that happen where it wants to redirect to a non SSL page with a different certificate. And it's, it seems like DNS spoofing. Cause that's kind of how they do that to make those portals work. And so I started loading a non SSL page anytime I, you know, realized what was going on and it totally worked. And so there, there's your answer. But there's an even better answer. And this is where I think it was Jason Hooper on Twitter uh, shared a URL to use. And the URL is easy to remember. It's never SSL.com. So as more and more sites become SSL capable or even just SSL only, um, it's harder and harder to find one when you need to tell your browser, no, please go to a, uh, you know, a non-secure uh, link. And so never SSL.com says they will never be SSL and that hopefully should do it. So there you go for those captive portal things. You know what I mean? Did you run into that too, John? It was funny. The behavior of it was inconsistent depending if I was using, I think on my Mac, it actually just logged right into whatever MGM. Yeah. Whatever the, the name was, it was a sure. MGM property. It was actually kind of interesting because when we moved between buildings that were both MGM properties, um, my phone actually connected automatically. It's like, oh, here's here's MGM uh, Wi-Fi. Right, right. Yeah, it was really neat. But I think on my computer, it didn't ask for any additional information, but for my iDevice, it did, which I thought was kind of weird. Huh. So it didn't seem to do authentication on one device. Yep. Um, but on the other, it did. Yep. All right. Well, there you go. So there's uh there's your there's your tip for today. I we have uh another tip that came from both Leon and uh Abby in our Facebook group at MacGeekab.com slash Facebook, where Leon started talking about how he got tired of Dropbox being a CPU hog again. And uh and he also needs to sync with like Google Drive and Microsoft OneDrive. And it was driving him crazy to have all of these things. Dropbox is an awful CPU hog. It seems to want to be aware of any changes that are happening to files anywhere on your Mac, as opposed to just in the Dropbox folder. It's not doing anything wrong with them uh, or doing anything to them at all, quite frankly. But anytime there's, you know, file activity anywhere, Dropbox just like, you know, spawns up and, and goes nuts. Um, and really, it should only be doing that on its folder. But hey, whatever. Uh, so he said, um, you know, combine those three with his Synology cloud station drive. Uh, and he says, I started getting overwhelmed with all my sync clients. He says, I don't use any apps on my Mac that require direct access to any of these clients APIs. So I found a nice way to clean it up. I installed cloud sync on his Synology, on my Synology. I'm, uh, I'll stick with Leon's voice here. So he says, I use cloud sync on my Synology so that it syncs with Dropbox, Google, and OneDrive. I share the synced folders from my Synology and then use the Synology Cloud Station Drive client to sync everything to my Mac. So he's got his disk station, his Synology, doing all of the work of syncing with these varied services. And then his Mac only syncs with his disk station, uh, which, of course, it can do locally or remotely. And that's where he gets his updates all from one app and uh, and he says it really simplifies things and his CPU is way more idle than it used to be. Well, that's interesting. Um, I haven't done that yet, but I like the I like the efficiencies therein. Of course, it leaves you with a single point of failure. But, you know, I mean, you got to pick one or the other. So and it's not really a single point of failure. It's just a single point of failure of convenience. If something happens to your disk station and you need a file that was on Dropbox, you can still go get that from Dropbox. It's not like it's inaccessible to you. It's just not conveniently accessible. And then um, 
in the comments there, Abby commented, he says, I use expand drive to do the same thing. Um, and he says, and the benefit there is that the APIs and hidden files all still work. And the nice part about expand drive is you don't need to have a Synology disk station to do this. Expand drive does it all just on your Mac. So there's two solutions to the problem you didn't know you have, but now you do. <laughs> so what do you think, John? Yeah, I was having a, so I'm using the, you know, cloud station. Okay. Um, and actually I was having it act up. So here's a, a tip for some people here. So I was, I noticed it was taking quite a bit of space. So I'm like, Hmm, I wonder what, yeah. you know, what it's getting so excited about. What it was getting excited about is that, uh, apparently it, it saw the activity in the, uh, now that I have iCloud photo library on, it kept getting really upset that that file kept changing. <laughs> Even though you a lot of time, even though you weren't sync syncing it. that file with Cloud Station, or you were syncing that with Cloud Station. Yes, I was. Oh, okay. The thing All is, right. the, no, gotcha. and, and okay. so the acti and, and so the, there was a flurry of activity where it kept getting stuck on the iCloud photo library file and kept trying to update it because it saw like constant activity on it. It's like, well, I you know I got to sync this because it's changing. Oh, right. it changed again. Right. And it was taken up like half of my CPU, and so I'm like, okay, let's not sync that mm. and it's yeah so, i wouldn't uh, I, I i ran into that i think i tried with was it dropbox or maybe it was resilio sync which was BitTorrent sync prior um I, I ran into the same thing a couple of years ago when i decided to start syncing my my photo library that way and it was like oh yeah no no no, this is bad and actually i, I ran into it becoming corrupted over and over again it was finally like no i need to back this up a different way so I just clone it daily now from where it lives in an active sense to a location. Actually, I think it's on my disk station, but it doesn't matter. You, know, you clone it anywhere you want. And I just do that. And it's backed up, but not synced. And life is, is calmer and more predictable, which is good. So, Yeah, good. Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Are um. All right. So, uh, you know what? Actually, I want to take a minute and thank everybody on our premium subscriber list that uh, that made their contributions this week. As you know, uh, premium is a huge part of what supports our ability to continue to do this here at uh, at Mac Geek Gab Central. And, uh, you know, it sort of in the same vein, we couldn't do this without you. Um, it really takes all of us to be perfectly fair. You know, uh, the questions and tips from everyone, everybody listening, uh, every one of you matters uh, for us for a variety of reasons. Um, and, you know, they're sort of all over the place, but uh, but we really do. And, and those of you that can and are willing to contribute some, you know, helps even a little bit more. And so if you want to learn about that, go to MacGeekGab.com slash premium. This week, we had uh, a one-time $25 contribution from Jim L. On the monthly $10 plan, we had Nick S. and David M. renew this week. Also, Micah P., who is on the monthly $15 plan. And then on the biannual $25 plan, we have Michael D., Dionisio Y., Dan B., Mike D., Ralph M., Tim M., and Joseph K. And then adding to the biannual plan this week uh, was Tom H. at a $75 every six month contribution. So thank you to all of you. Like I said, we um, we couldn't do this without you. And it really means a lot. So thank you so much. And with that, John, I want to get into something that might lead to a little bit of a, a cerebral conversation, which is good for us. And that is some of the changes that have happened recently to macOS or been announced uh, that are coming to macOS server. For those of you that don't know, macOS server has essentially been a graphical interface to add, that you can add for 20 bucks from Apple to your Mac to give you the ability to manage a bunch of what otherwise would be command line only type of services for um, servers of, of a variety of kinds, the file servers and web servers and mail servers and DNS servers and calendar servers and all of that stuff. Well, 
Apple announced that um, macOS server is changing to focus more on management of computers, devices and storage on your network. And some changes are coming in how server works in that a number of services will be deprecated and will be hidden on new installations of an update coming in spring 2018. They do say if you've already configured one of these services, you'll still be able to use it in this macOS server update. But I will point out that, you know, deprecation generally follows a path of we're going to recommend you stop using it. We're going to not let new people use it. And then we're not going to let people use it at all. I don't think these services are out going to actually leave Mac OS. They are just not going to be part of the GUI that is uh, Mac OS server. And they include calendar servers, contacts servers, DHCP, DNS, mail servers, messages servers, net install, VPN servers, web servers and wiki servers. And there are at least two, if not three that are being deprecated in every one of those categories. And, and when I look at the web server category and I see that Apache Nginx and light HTTPD are being deprecated, there are no others. So it's gone. It's not that they're saying, well, these aren't really used often. So we'll turn them off in favor of something else. No, no. If you're not going to have Apache and Nginx, you don't have web servers so that they're just they're just closing off these these things before i so well, what do you think about this john i don't know if they should call it server anymore because what they're offering is what a server is supposed to do whereas their proposed redirection you know to device management i don't see that as really a purpose of a purpose of a server I'd, I'd more call that like a management console or a configurator, right? Right. And in, I believe that Mac OS server for device management, does it do it? It doesn't do it remotely, right? It's, it's only for things that you direct attach. So you'd still need something like Jamf or Meraki or, you know, any one of those um, other, you, you know, remote MDM services. Uh, mobile device management services. So, yeah, I I I saw this as a very dim bit of news. But in our Facebook group, which is why I love this group, Graham posted, he said, I have to admit that most of my clients who use server are now doing so just for storage purposes, file sharing and time machine. They will be a, there. There will be a few affected by this change. But they're likely they're just as likely to not upgrade or update Mac OS anyway. So that's interesting, right? And maybe this is where Apple's decision is coming from, that most people aren't bothering to use a web server and a calendar server and a contact server or any of that. Most of their users aren't. So the cost of maintaining and updating that GUI um doesn't make sense for Apple if the people that are using this are are not using those um, much, if at all. And so maybe it's them just saying, OK, here's what our customers are using and let's go use it. And if that's the case, well, then that's not a bad thing at all, is it? Right. Just because it's there doesn't mean people use it. Sure. Uh, so maybe this isn't I mean, I know the dim had, news they... that I thought it was. I mean, there's, and actually, now that I think about it, it is, there's kind of an indirect way to use it for device management when we were talking about um, uh, radius or something similar. I know that this came up is that you can potentially use, uh, it, it's it's kind of hidden though. Okay. That type of service. That's really the only device man. But it, I mean, to me, that's something that people, most people really aren't using. Uh OS server, uh, Mac OS server for. Right, right. No, yeah, just yeah. The, again, digging back, I know that they have a, a, a version of radius buried within server and you can use that. You know, I think the, the topic was, you know, how do I prevent my uh, kids from using, you know, the internet or the Wi-Fi uh, during certain times. So I'm going to offer uh, a correction to what I said before, John. Um, mm -hmm. it, they are taking all of these things out, but what they list mm -hmm. on here is alternatives that you can go and get. So they're saying 
yeah, we're taking out web, you know, the ability to configure web serving, which in OS server is uh, Apache, right? But here's a link to go run Apache on your own or a link to go run Nginx on your own or a link to go run light HTTPD. So it's not like they're taking those out. They're offering that these are your options. Um, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks for that. That's actually Graham in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. Hello. Uh, for uh, for offering that that bit of correction. But still, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm surprised that people aren't. Although I guess, you know, I was going to say I'm surprised people aren't running calendar servers. I grok why people might not be running, you know, DHCP or DNS on their Mac OS server. Like you've got a router it's going to be able to do that. This is duplicate functionality. There's a reason to leverage it. Don't get me wrong. You know, having all, like you said, John, even using radius or whatever, having all of your authentication and accounts in one place can really help with simplification of management. Um, but, you know, running a mail server is it's heavy lifting, man. It's, and that can be a real bear. Um, so yeah, I, but calendar, I always kind of felt like, I, I'm surprised if people aren't using calendar server because it seems like that would have been a good, uh, it seems like Apple was putting a lot of work into that and maybe they were for a while and then walked away. So, so there you go. Yeah. All right. Well, there's uh there's one, anything, anything else on this, John, before we move on? No, I, I noticed they just uh, actually upgraded server. With, with the other updates that came out. Right, knows, right. I think it's like 5.5 right now, and they fixed a few bugs. Okay, um, okay. Huh, all right. Um, a question from listener Todd that I think might also send us into the, in, the, uh, in this direction, John. He says, uh, I know you've had a Synology NAS for a long time, both of you, and I think you're happy with them. He says, I'd love to get a NAS, but I've been reluctant to jump in for a few reasons. A big one being that, from reading forums and reviews, it sometimes doesn't play well with the Mac. I'd actually like to see those reviews because I've had pretty good experience with the Mac, but he, he makes some other very salient points. Also, he says, despite DSM being a very well-regarded OS for a NAS, it still takes some configuration and skill to set up properly. That's very true. <clears throat> he says, so uh, I've long hoped for an Apple NAS, not because I'm a fanboy and would buy anything Apple. He says, in fact, I've become very frustrated and disillusioned over th some things in the past few years. But he says, I think an Apple NAS would be so much easier to set up and more reliable, at least for NAS newbies like me. I'd even well, be they fine. Had one. Remember? Uh, let me let me finish his thought here. And then okay. and then, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, I'd even be fine with something Eero like. I know there are a few user friendly, Mac friendly NAS boxes already, like MyCloud from WD and Apollo from Promise, but they don't seem to have great reviews. He said, today I saw an article at Apple World uh, discussing that Apple might finally be exploring a NAS. He saw an article about um, a patent filed for, you know, personal cloud uh, type stuff from Apple. He says that I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on how an Apple NAS could be better than a Synology or how a Synology NAS can be tricky with a map or if you entirely disagree. So John, d d yeah, finish your thought there. Well, I thought it was, and actually I, I actually played with one um, many years ago when Apple had, a, or I had a relationship with a Apple enterprise sales because I was working in an enterprise, not the enterprise, but right. Right, of course. Um, but but the XServe was Apple's first shot at that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I I would call that more of a server than a network attached storage device. I, I mean, I realize. Well, if I recall, that it offered the, the option thing. and that you yeah, and that you could arrange the, uh, you know, you could you could arrange the disks in in some sort of RAID, from what I recall. So it could have been. Oh. Yeah, yeah, from that it, standpoint. It would act as a NAS. And, and then the other thing I'm looking at here, so I finally just fired up the latest version of a server on my machine here. And here's something else interesting, which I don't know if they're going to deprecate, but there's a category, advanced category in the server currently called XSAN. Okay. Which apparently uh, you can use fiber channel to connect to what they call a storage area network. I'll have to dig into that. So that sounds like another kind of nasy like Thing huh. they may currently do at least with server, but I, I don't happen to have any fiber channel stuff here. So right, right, right. 
Huh. Yeah. It, well, OK, so I, I, you're right, right? Because a, a server and a NAS, I mean, it, it, you know, they're kind of the same thing. But in like Apple's definitely never offered a NAS for consumers. And, it, you know, right. anytime somebody starts talking about NAS for newbies, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I like the hairs on my the back of my neck stand up. And now, first of all. Should Apple like it, do we would we want an uh, an Apple NAS before before we even get into the NAS for newbies, you know, question. And I, I don't I don't know. I, I mean, certainly there's a lot of smart people at Apple. They could focus on making a great, you know, network attached storage or private cloud device or whatever you would want to call that. But like that doesn't fall into what I consider Apple's core competency. And so I'm not Agreed. sure and there's plenty of players in the space already. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and to, to Apple's credit, like they'll it wouldn't surprise me if they had a team go and build like if Apple were to build, build a NAS, what would that be like? So, you know, you whatever, 25 people go like run forth and do this. And then Apple will evaluate it in comparison to what their customers want or what they think their customers want and what the market already offers. And if they feel like they can, they've got something that's remarkably better, they'll go ahead and roll it out. And if they don't, uh, y- you know, they'll just kill the project. And and I think that's a like that's a really good trait uh, of Apple is that they're willing to invest something and then say no. Um, my guess is that that is what keeps happening there because and probably where this patent came from. Right. They developed something. Uh, but I like I just don't. I, I can't see what Apple would add to this that would be valuable. And and the reason is that, you know, like, I, I totally get what you're saying. I, I actually don't get what you're saying about Synology not playing nice with the Mac. It, it, their Apple, like, clients and native apps and everything that integrate really work well for me. Um, and, you know, I can connect to it anywhere I want, any way I want. It really for me has become an extension of my Apple universe. So, so from that standpoint, yeah. it's great, but it's very complex. I, I mean, the user interface is friendly. Uh, it's easy to do things once you know how to do them, <laughs> you know, like it's, but I, it, I will say to your comment earlier about UX, yeah. um, I, I don't, the DSM user experience for setting up certain things is terrible. Right. Totally. You have to go to like four different places. Like I remember, you know, setting up a, you know, like trying to set up a quota for, for a time machine user. You, you have to pop into like, you know, several areas in order to get that right. 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 So oh yeah. No, no, am no. I doing, it, am I doing this right? Yeah. So. Am I, is this, is this really how they meant for me to do this? And then you go and read the forums and you're like, yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, well. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. That, that Like that part of it. Like again, once you know what to do, it's very easy to get around. So it it's not clumsy in that standpoint, but it's definitely it lacks a lot of intuitiveness that is, um, you know, sort of a, the trade off for all the flexibility that you can have. Yeah. So, and in yeah. in our chat room here, actually, Brian brings up a good point: is that a uh, time machine was kind of Apple's NAS, mm-hmm. though you know it didn't have any sort of a. Uh, you know, it was a single drive network attached. Yeah. In a sense. It yeah. didn't have, it had the smarts of a router, but it didn't have the smarts of like being able to run any other services other than file sharing, which, mm-hmm. you know, again, like that's probably what 90% of the people need. Um, but you know, that like the thing when we talk about NAS for newbies, you know, or, or as I like to call it, the novice NAS conundrum, um, I, I don't I like the Venn diagram of the circle of novice users and the circle of people that are using a NAS. Like I, I feel like they either those circles never intersect or they only intersect for a sliver, because I think once you get a NAS, you will like you. You are no longer a novice user. Like I, I, I just don't see how. You would do this. I, I guess the one way that Apple could do like, you know, private cloud or novice NAS or whatever is to sell you really just a black box or a white box or whatever you want. That's totally not configurable. 
right? Just a magic box that sits on your network and uh, automatically your iCloud photo library is just on it, right? Without you having to configure anything, automatically your iCloud drive is just on it without you having to configure anything. You know, it becomes a software update server mm -hmm. without, again, no configuration. You just plug it in and go. And the only thing you know about is like maybe controlling storage quotas, you know, with a, with sliders for users or something like I can see that being valuable to be perfectly honest, but that would frustrate the geeks. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't sell that, but like once they, if they were to even begin to cater to the geeks with a box like that, it would still be frustrating because it wouldn't ever have enough features to, you know, to, to, to be what geeks want. So it'd be better to leave it as I initially described, just this completely, you know, unconfigurable thing. You can't add apps to it. You can't make it into, you know, a media server in that sense or, you know, tweak it or do whatever you want. It just becomes this thing that that's just a data storehouse. Um, and we've seen yeah. this every but time. For some people that is what they're looking for. Like, especially when I'm into like the, uh, the totally. photo plus show photographers, they just want for the most part, they just want a place to store their pictures and they don't have to worry about raid levels and stuff like that. They just throw discs into it and they get storage. Right. Yeah. If storage is all you want with a NAS, then absolutely, you know, NAS for novices works. But as soon as, as you start opening that door or it, and maybe even better to say it this way, as soon as a manufacturer provides you a path to open that door beyond storage, what I've experienced, certainly for myself, but also, you know, hearing from you folks listening and, and others is that because th there have been some NASAs for novices built with like a, a very limited set of beyond storage features, you know, like maybe one little media server or an iTunes server or something over time, and it doesn't take much time, those services sort of become uh, uh, stale and users want more or different or an upgrade or something. And without the ability and the openness of something like a Synology or a QNAP, where you just have all these services available, maybe too much for, for novices, in fact, definitely too much. It, you you immediately like there's this frustration that sets in at about the six month mark. Right. So these people buy these novice NAS things and put stuff on them and then realize, hey, well, if I can do that on here, wouldn't it make sense to do this? And then suddenly you hit a wall and most of those people wind up jumping to, you know, Synology or or QNAP uh, really are the two that that are worth talking about in in that sense. So I I like. If you want more than just, you know, black box that you never think about and never can configure, which I, I do actually, now that we've described it, I, th I think that would be a great thing for Apple to make, to be perfectly honest. Um, but if like that would be good and then something with all the openness, like a Synology would be good. Anything in between, I think just leads to frustration. Hmm. I, like that, that's just I, my I experience. Still, yeah. Yeah. Well, my observation is that for a lot of people, a Drobo is, uh, if you just want storage, is exactly what they need because you don't need any knowledge of, you know, all the technical. Right. Right. No, yeah. I totally, I totally agree with that. If all you want is storage, that's right. But, but like Drobo opens up that dr door of frustration with their, you know, here's a couple of app type things that you can add to this. And mm -hmm. And, it, you know, invariably, like we get emails from people all the time. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, I love the, you know, maybe they had a direct attached Drobo, which are great, you know, for storage. And then they're like, I got a networked one and it's great for storage. And it has these other things that I started playing around with. But can I do this? Or, do you know how to do that? It's like, yeah, um, not possible. Got to move beyond. There's, you know, you just hit the wall. Like, oh, OK. So I feel like they should just not even have that door open. It should just be network storage and nothing more. I, I don't know. Maybe, um, you know, whatever. It's not my company. I can, I can, you know, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> you know, there you go. All right. Yep. Okay. Now, where are we, John? Uh, you know what? Let's just stick with it. So Leslie, uh, Leslie wrote in and 
sort of opened the HomePod can of worms. It says, I think the best reason to buy HomePod and Apple's main reason for making it is that it's an extension of Apple Music. It will be the easiest way to stream the service. HomePod is to Apple Music as Apple Watch is to iPhone. Now, that's a really interesting perspective on HomePod. Um, it, you know, it's been interesting watching HomePod, the messaging around HomePod change, right? When they announced it at WWDC, it was that plus Home Assistant with Siri plus, um, you know, multi-room audio plus stereo pairing, right? And I thought, man, those three things, the Home Assistant, the multi-room audio, the stereo, stereo pairing, and I think we even said that on this show, are really difficult to do. And I would say even impossible to do right the first time out of the gate because you need a, a very, very widespread, you know, test audience. So I feel like the HomePod uh, beta test begins on February 9th, right? And it's an open beta and you can pay to participate in it by buying a HomePod. And what you get out of it is you get to play with this thing and you'll be the first to get updates because they'll push them out via software. And and so what's changed with the messaging is, you know, two weeks ago, they said, all right, uh, multi-room audio and stereo pairing. We're not doing those in version one because it, like it's really hard to do. They had to pick one hard thing to do out of the gate. And that's, uh, you know, Siri out loud. Right. Uh, far field voice with Siri. Also extremely difficult to do. But I, I don't think they could get away with not having Siri in it at some point on day one. And I honestly, I think that's where the delays came from was that. Right. I don't think it's a hardware issue or anything. None of these parts are, are you know, difficult to get or anything like that. I, and I don't think they're going to sell so many of them that it's going to constrain supply. Uh, I mean, I think they'll sell plenty of them. Don't get me wrong. But um, but uh, but yeah. And and then to downplay that even more. Right. Last week in Canada, Tim Cook starts talking about how. The best part about HomePod is that it's a really great sounding speaker, not even talking about how great Siri is, because even the initial reviews are like, eh, yeah, Siri's tough on this thing, which is exactly what I heard from somebody that I talked to at CES that has one. Um, and they'll get it right. I have no doubt. But having watched, you know, Amazon and Google do this and having with the voice and then having watched Sonos, you know, struggle and figure out how multi-room audio works in millions of homes when thing conditions are weird and different. Like this is going to be a support nightmare for Apple and they need to sort of embrace that and make it a part of the way the product works because it's just the only way that goes. Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, the, the messaging change from these four things down to these two things, and then really just focusing on the one, I think I, I would assume, and I can't wait to hear one. I ordered one, um, that HomePod will sound great. You know, will it sound better than a $250 speaker or better than a $10,000 speaker is, is, or an $85,000 speaker as some people on Reddit are claiming. I don't know. Right. Well, find out. Um, but sound quality is not a problem we needed solved. It's not a bad problem to solve. Right. It's a really good problem to solve, in fact. But like other people have solved that problem. That's a that's a checked box. So it's interesting to see Apple, you know, refocusing their messaging to the point where they're saying, hey, me too. Um so it's it, it's interesting to me. I, I'm curious to watch this. What do you think, John? I think it's not for me. Are you sure about that? Uh, not for the uh, well, not for the the uh, smart home stuff because right, none of my stuff speaks HomeKit. So, well, that's what I'm saying. Even Apple and the music is sort aspect, of downplaying uh, it. Yep. And my audio setup here, I'm I'm satisfied with. So, right. Yeah, but well, that's and that's just it. Aficionado as such as you, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it, but my sound, uh, yeah, even as a sound aficionado, I don't consider myself an audiophile. I like the term you just used, right? Sound aficionado. I oh, care. Okay. I can. No, I do. I care about sound, but I'm not like 
I don't get to me audio files and there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, I think it's great to me. Audio files. It's as much about the hobby as it is about how it actually sounds. Right. So like th there are people out there that will tell you until their last breath that vinyl sounds better. Right. And we've had this conversation in different ways here, but it, like and, and two amps. And tube amps sound better. Right, right, right. No. And only speakers that I built with my hands sound the way I want them to sound. And like confirmation bias is such a real thing and and such an OK thing. In fact, it's a necessary part of it that like even if we're aware of the fact that that confirmation bias could affect us, it still affects us exactly the same. Right. It's, especially when it comes to audio, because if we think that, that vinyl sounds better, which I don't, by the way, but it doesn't matter if you do. It's great that you do. If you think it sounds better and therefore in your mind, it does sound better playing vinyl, then that's great, right? It sounds good to you. And that's what matters. It doesn't like that. It's the end result, which is the sort of the combination of it. And to me, the audiophiles are the hobbyists that like to spend time so that when they go and enjoy their music after spending all this time and, and money and research and, and tweaking or whatever it is, they, they, you know, however they get themselves there, like that's, that's cool. I, I appreciate that stuff. I understand some of it, certainly not all of it. And, but it, it's not my hobby, right? I have other hobbies, plenty of them, but not enough time in the day. So uh, to me, I just want music to sound good. I also suffer from confirmation bias. Like I like Sono stuff sounds good. Is it the greatest sound in the world? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, probably not, but it sounds really good. They keep working on making it sound better. And the Sonos experience, again, just like the vinyl experience for some and the tube amp experience for others. For me, the Sonos experience is delightful. And it sounds you know, good enough, frank, frankly, a lot more than good enough so that I like I'm happy with the whole of it. And yes, some confirmation bias, you know, falls into that. So but that's the thing is like people that were going to solve this problem have solved it, not only manufacturers, but customers. And I, I even saw Rene Ritchie, you know, it's it's been interesting watching him because he he seems to be very bullish on HomePod. I don't think he's heard it since WWDC. But, um, but, you know, he's posting very, very positive things and really trying to work on this audio quality angle and, and how that's going to be great. But even he said, yeah, you know, I've got a bunch of Sonos stuff in my house. I was hoping to only want to buy one HomePod and not replace all of my Sonos stuff with, with HomePod. Like he solved that problem too. So it, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm curious where this goes. Uh, obviously Apple is big enough to, to compete in any market they want to compete in, you know, speakers, cars, airplanes, whatever they want to do, they could do. And they could last out that first, whatever, you know, ramp up period where they have to sort of wait for buying cycles to come around and people to really buy these things. So uh, if, you know, if Apple wants to do this, but like, I'm just not, I'm not sure where HomePod fits, but I said the same thing about the iPod, iPad uh, when that came out. And now you'd have to pry mine from my cold dead fingers. So, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I think for HomePod to succeed, they will need, you know, HomePod mini and home home bar or HomePod bar, bar pod or something sound bar ish to pair with an Apple TV. Why that doesn't seem to be part of the roadmap in the short term is weird to me. Um, I have an Apple TV in my living room along with my HomePod and yet the sound from my Apple TV for movies and, and shows on it cannot be involved with HomePod and never will be, to be perfectly honest. I've heard some people say, well, you could buy two HomePods and put them in a stereo pair. Right. But you still need a center channel speaker to do that properly. Um, it doesn't have to be a super high quality center channel speaker. But uh, with music, you can get away with bouncing sound around and, and making it all sound good. Uh, you can get away with that with TV, too. but your or movies and TV as well, but um, you need a, a speaker in, that comes from the middle of your TV in order to 
not feel like you're in a weird zone watching TV with with dialogue coming from the sides and trying to be bounced in. So th there would need to be a different piece of hardware in a different form factor from Apple to help solve that problem. It's just a fact. So I don't know. I don't, like like th any other thoughts on this, John? I've been rambling. That's the fact. Jack. Jack. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. All right. Let's what? get technical. Here. Should we? Okay. Well, not yet. Okay. <laughs> we can get technical. Kind of it's fine. It. You want to ease into it? All right. We'll take uh we'll take Kenny's question from Facebook then. Um we're at the hour mark, so we got a little time here. Uh Kenny says I'm looking for some advice. Is there a site that you can plug in some information about something you want to buy or find and then get notifications from that site if a less expensive price is found? Uh, it would be ideal for something you kind of want to buy, but only if you can find a deal. Uh, I think that explains it. And so there are there are plenty of sites in the in the Facebook comments. People mentioned slick deals. They mentioned camel, camel, camel. Uh, and, um, uh, what's the other one? Thrifter.com. I think John was, was one you mentioned in a previous show too, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah they have, um, daily deals and I've, I've got a couple of them. I don't know how they swing it. It's you go to Amazon and it's like, oh, well, here's a, you know, virtual coupon for the thing that, so I don't know if they scour Amazon for things. Yeah. I'm but sure yeah, they no, do. I've, I, I bought a router and, uh, yeah. a few other things through them. Well, it's good. That's good. Yep. The so, other thing I know is that some credit cards um, have like a rewind feature. I think one of my uh, city cards does, where if you find something for a lower price, they'll actually refund the money to you, which is uh, kind of slick. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, in fact, I've had that done quite a bit. Most most of your credit cards, cards especially like rewards cards that have uh, some more features and, and you might pay an annual fee for it. A lot of those add, you know, whatever, somewhere between 30 and 90 days of price protection. And if you can find it, you know, on, on uh, for sale, I should say at a lower price, they'll just credit you back. So, yeah. All right. Good. If you have any of those, send them to us. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I don't know if I heard you right. Well, I think I do because I'm, I'm getting less congested now. But uh, I'm pretty sure, Dave, you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. As far as you know, I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, you want to take us to Jim, John? Now you want to dive into some of the tech stuff? Yeah. Okay. Jim's got a head scratcher. And uh, actually, we may have to cogitate on this for a bit because... <sighs> Dive right in. Okay. All right. So Jim says, I need some help with my new to me refurbished 15 inch Retina MacBook Pro mid 2014 running High Sierra. Upon receipt of the machine, which already had one admin account configured with all of the High Sierra updates installed, which is kind of weird. Um, I think uh, I've never received a refurb machine that's already set up. No, um, but I can see it happening. I mean, you know, if the if the refurbishment process, you know, slipped through someone's fingers the wrong way, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think this may be the basis of uh, this may be the cause of the problem here. Let's continue. So he says that I then use migration assistant to bring two accounts with files and applications from my MacBook Air 2011 running Sierra to the new MacBook Pro. After the migration, I attempted to enable File Vault from the admin account that was on the machine at the time of the purchase. File Vault listed both of the two other accounts previously on my MacBook Air and asked for their passwords, which I entered and the system validated. Trying to enable File Vault by clicking Continue, the system returned the following message. The following users weren't allowed to unlock this disk because an unknown error occurred. Ugh. Then it listed the names of the two user accounts that I migrated. Have you run into this error or found any way to control? Correct it. All right, first off, I hate when I hate error messages that say it's the unknown error. It's like, you know, you know, you're just not telling <laughs> you me. Know. Right? Yeah, totally. I mean, if it knows an error occurred, how can it say, but I, I, it's like I know an error occurred, but I don't. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hooey. I'll shake my fist at them along with numeric error codes. Guys, stop. <laughs> Put it in my language. All right. So I did, I did some surfing here, and I actually found an article, which we should link to here, but it talks about, uh, it's actually from uh, uh, UVM, uh, University of Vermont, I guess, right? Oh, yeah, right over in Burlington. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but they had a little article on their uh, uh, support site saying File Vault 2, enabling and disabling additional authorized users. And I think I came across that article because I typed in the name of the stupid error. And this is one of the things that came up. Um, now, I've never seen this. So the thing is, I work. if you work your way um, through the article, at some point you'll see the File Vault screen. And I don't see this, Dave, and I don't think you do because, well, I don't know about you, but I only have one user on my computer. So I'm never going to see this dialogue that says, oh, by the way, there's a, you know, when you go through File Vault on a machine with multiple accounts, like he said, you should get a confirmation to allow those users. However, he, you know, adds them and confirms them and then the unknown error occurs. Um, one suggestion, Dave, is a lot of times if the GUI doesn't work, you got to roll up your sleeves and go into the terminal. And the thing is, Dave, I did not know this, so we just learned at least one new thing. Well, no, we've learned a lot. Yeah. Um, but from the, the command line, you can issue the following. Uh, sudo space FDE setup space add space dash user to add space username. You may have success adding that user, adding a, a, a user that way. Sure. And yeah, it's the file vault configuration tool, which I never huh. knew. I never knew that there was I, such a thing. I, yeah, I didn't. Line. I'm with you. I didn't know that that, uh, that that was even a thing. Like I didn't. It seems weird to me for whole disk encryption that you would have users that couldn't access the disk. I mean, although. I, I get it, right? From a from a security model standpoint, sure. From a, a user experience, you know, these are built for consumers standpoint. Wow, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like it? Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know why there's this level of granularity. Yeah. Because exactly. As far as I know, the as far as I know, the key is stored in the recovery partition, the the file vault key, right? Or at least the one point it was. Huh. So I, I don't know why you need this additional level here, but so a couple of suggestions, Dave. So one is try to add the authorized user using the command line. The other, like I said, it made me kind of nervous that the machine already came with an admin account. You may want to take that machine and do a fresh install. Yeah. And go through the, I'm thinking because it was already set up, there may be some other restrictions on that admin account well it sounds like there are because <laughs> he imported them too so my suggestion would be to to uh, reformat um yeah i would reformat and do the migration assistant again and i think you may have a more pleasant experience yeah yeah the yeah, other yeah. thing is that the air now this may have affected the migration so he said the air that he wants to bring the stuff from has sierra um last i checked that class of machine can run High Sierra. So I'm wondering if upgrading that machine to High Sierra may, there may be some mysterious incompatibility with uh, importing from a Sierra machine to a High Sierra. I don't know. Yeah. Just a thought. I, I don't think it could hurt. And, and yet Mac Tracker indicates that the, that that vintage machine should um, accept that update. Hmm. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's a weird one. Um Huh. Yeah. All right. Uh two things about that. Well, number one, I was a little distracted. So you'll you'll appreciate this, John, um, because my machine started deciding that it needed to run four or five processes right now, full tilt to index spotlight, all these MD worker processes fired up. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thankfully in the chat room, I asked, I'm like, can somebody remind me of the terminal command to just disable spotlight? I can't think about it. And uh, and Brian Monroe saved my butt. So sudo mdutil dash i off slash solve that problem for me. After we finish recording, I'll I'll turn it back on. It seems MD stores is probably erasing my spotlight index right now, uh, but that's okay. It'll rebuild it later. Um, he also pointed out though, uh, several times, and Brian's a, uh, consultant out in the San Francisco Bay area uh, for lack of, I th actually, I think that's exactly right. And, uh, and so he sees a lot of these machines, you know, in person as many of our listeners do. 
And he started by saying, do not enable file vault on a MacBook Air. Uh, they corrupt the system. And he says, I've seen a couple of MacBook Airs that do not like file vault. Please tell them to skip file vault. Uh, so clearly he's had an experience with this. Um, I have still my old 2011 air that, you know, I breathed new life into recently with disabling all those other things that wanted to run in the background. And, uh, and I have no problems with file vault two on that machine, but, uh, but I, you know, I don't want to discount Brian's experiences here. If he's seen that on multiple machines, it's worth sort of factoring that into our canon of knowledge here. So thanks, Brian. Yeah. Good, John. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, now I got to figure out where I am. I had to, had to do some on the fly stuff. Oh yeah. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Royce. He has a question about Java. He says, I keep getting a pop-up window on my 13 inch MacBook pro that says to use the Java command line tool. You need to install a JDK. Click more info to visit the Java developer kit download website. And he says, it took me to some Java page where I cannot track down anything that looks like it would make this thing go away forever. Uh, in the course of a day, it will pop up about four to eight times. Definitely if the computer is left running overnight and doesn't seem associated with any specific app running in the foreground, any ideas of what course of action I could take. So there's a couple things that, and we'll actually, we'll tell you how to, how to install Java on your, on your Mac, but then we'll also talk about how to figure out what might be wanting to run it. Um, but the first thing I'll say is that Java is not bad. Uh, it, it has gotten a, uh, it is, it is, there is a negative association with Java, uh, largely because of running Java inside your web browser via the plugin can be very, very bad because it opened up all kinds of security holes in in different ways. There's just no way to protect around that if you're going to choose to let some website run a program on your computer, right? Let's think about that again. Some website gets to run its own program on your computer without you really having anything to say about it after saying, okay. So that's where Java can be very, very bad. But if there were a way to say run you know, objective C binaries from a website on your computer, that would also be very, very bad. It's not just Java. It's, it's that Java has the flexibility to allow this. Don't, but running Java binaries that you've downloaded or installed on your Mac that you know what they are, that's totally okay. Just like it's totally okay to run objective C binaries that you've installed on your Mac, <laughs> like all good. Java binaries need usually a Java runtime environment, a JRE, not Java development kit. And maybe that's what Royce needs here, too. But there you can go get either. So um, to get the Java runtime environment, and that's honestly, even though I know it's saying you got to get a JDK, like I would start with the JRE, I think, Um at, that's at java.com slash en slash download, right? We'll put that in the in the show notes. Uh, and then, John, you found a link to download the development kit. The, the, the downloading the, um, the JRE, the runtime environment, is pretty, pretty straightforward, right? The, the web page is just sort of looks normal and, and easy to, to understand what you're supposed to do. I think there's one link and you just download it and you're good to go. Um, don't let it install the plugin in your browser though, or if it does just disable it, uh, the page to download the development kit looks like it's built. Hey, for developers and you've got all kinds of, S of things. There's J Java development kit right now. Anyway, eight U one six one. Then there's Java. or sorry. Java S E development kit eight U one six one. Then there's Java S E development kit eight U one six two. Then there's demos and samples for each of those. Um, I would choose, uh, and then any, in each of those is things for different flavors, like six different flavors of Linux, five different flavors of Solaris, two flavors of windows, and thankfully only one for Mac OS. And it's a disc image. So I would either pick eight, U the development kit for eight, U one, six, one, or eight, U one, six, two. I don't know why they're offering two. maybe they're transitioning from one to the other. Do you know, John? I'd pick the I'd pick the the first one on the page is frankly what I would do. 
Uh, I think eight is the current. Yeah, I think eight is what you want. Well, eight, well, but they're both eight. It's either eight U one six one or eight U one six two. I mean, oh well, the latest is always the best. Oh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, right. I'd pick the one at the top of the page, which is eight U one six one. I don't think. I mean, unless you're actually doing development, you're probably not going to care about the the changes in in one six two. And if they're not confident enough to have that as the only one on the page, I'm okay with that. All right. So d- just download the disk image there if the runtime environment doesn't work and get it installed. Um, and and then you'll be able to run Java on your Mac. And and these are both these websites that we're going to link to are not Apple websites. They are Oracle websites. Oracle maintains Java these days. Now, Apple used to offer their own packaging and sometimes that is the cause especially on older machines why you get a java related dialogue right 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 yeah it was kind of confusing for a while because you know java was supposed to be right once run anywhere it's like well why is apple making their own version then (laughs) yeah (laughs) because it's apple john Mm -hmm. yeah um so do, do you agree? With, I mean, you've done some Java development. I've only ever worked with people that have done it and and then, of course, run things on my Mac. Would you agree that even though it's saying to download the JDK, they should they should probably just download the JRE or or is it the is the JDK what they want? Am I wrong on this? I mean, the, the runtime is a subset. Right. And should be all you need to run Java stuff. So I'd, I'd start with that. OK. You- OK. Unless you feel there's a reason you want the JDK, because, you know, I think it includes documentation and, you know, a lot of extra stuff, but it's meant for developers. So, yep. I know the just, runtime environment. I think it, that's the one that also includes the plugin, the browser plugin. So it's possible that um, that that's why uh, people are, are or that's why Apple is saying just download the JDK so that you don't wind up with the. Um, with the, you know, with the plugin, because that browser plugin, you know, is, is, is where that security hole can exist. They, but Safari is really good about it, right? Even if you have the plugin, it's not just going to willy nilly let any website do it. It's going to ask you, Hey, this website wants to use Java. Do you want to let it use it once? Do you want to let it use it all the time? Or do you never want to let it use it? And, you know, like choose wisely. And if you don't know, choose never. Yeah. I don't know. You want to do one more question, John? Should we? What do I got here? Yeah. Wow. Pick any Java other. space dash version. Yep, I'm running 1.8. Just okay. to verify that. Yeah, okay. let me, actually, so, let me look here. I have terminal open, so I might as well do the same thing. Oh, look it. I got the, uh, it says to use the Java command line tool. You need to install a JDK. So I don't have one installed on this computer. And it does actually, whoa, now this is interesting, John. Searching Google for Java JDK. Uh, brings up the Java 8 page that we just talked about. Clicking Apple's more info link. I'm glad we did this. Brings up the Java SE 9 page, which has the JDK, the server JRE, and the regular JRE right there. So Java 9 is the newest, not Java 8. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Huh. Now, the other thing is that somebody could be trying to run. Uh, yeah, we we're talking about how, how to identify yeah. who may be trying to run Java, Dave. Yes. And I'll give you one way to find out. It just occurred to me. Yeah. Um, it could be a startup script. Well, how do you uh, search through your startup scripts here? Uh, I would say that uh, you probably want to use something like Lingon, which does have a search feature. And I just fired it up and searched for Java and it has two scripts that seem to be invoking Java. So that's a way to, that's one, it could be one source of, of somebody wanting to try to launch it. Yep. Um, what I usually do is, I mean, you kind of have to let it launch for, for this to happen. So your way might be better uh, is I run activity monitor. I find the Java process and I double click it and I see what, uh, you go into uh, uh, files and ports or whatever that that page is. I don't have activity monitor open, uh, but I'll get it there. And, uh, you know, you find the Java process, you double click it, you go to open files and ports and then look through that list. That list should generally sort of betray what 
files Java is talking with, and then maybe that'll that'll deal with it. So, well, that's my that's my thought. Do you have any thoughts? Mm, not anymore. All right, good. I took the links to Java eight out of the uh, out of the show notes, and I just put the links to Java nine in there so that uh, we don't confuse people. Sorry about that. Always glad when we can correct things before we have to ship the show. So, okay. Uh, do we want to answer another question here, John? Uh, Andrew, David, how about, let's, let's, let's go wild here. You want to go wild? Yeah. This is going to get out of control, man. Okay. I mean, we're at the yeah. hour 20 mark, so we could like wrap yeah. this up here, but you know, I, I feel like we can go a couple minutes. So which one do you want to go to? Uh, actually, Anders is kind of, um, here's a quick one. Okay. Uh, David. Good. So again, uh, Google foo to the rescue. So David asks, are you aware of a utility available that can block the use of removable media on a Mac? I have a client looking for a solution where it can control writing to external drives and can be locked down with admin only privs or better yet controlled by something like Jamf. Okay, so I think uh, I um, I think I created my search in the context of disabling the USB port uh, kernel extensions. Got it. Okay. So one way of uh, so a kernel extension. Well, one thing a kernel extension can do is let the software. Uh, aka the operating system right. like Mac OS talk to the hardware like a USB port if you don't have the right kernel extension oh, you're not going to sure. talk to the device yeah 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 um, so that was the direction I was taking which is uh, it came up in this article that I found at guess what Dave jamf.com <laughs> <laughs> wow and it was basically people saying how do I how do I achieve this yep and it started off with, okay, well, you know, here's all the kernel extensions, you know, they're, they're typically they have the word USB in them. And they were like, yeah, try to remove those. But then some other people were like, well, you know, that maybe that'd be a great idea, especially with system integrity protection is that, you know, if it sees you're fiddling around with the, uh, you know, kernel and stuff, it, it may uh, panic or not even let you do it. Uh, but then farther along in that article, Dave, someone um, did a screenshot of what I believe is the Jamf software, and it has a specific restrictions category and one of them is would you like to enable uh or disable uh very varying levels of access to external media so huh that's cool huh i like it that's good man so uh so i got the answer of course you got to uh so that's uh as far as i can tell exactly what you're looking for that's i think that's exactly what he's looking for yeah Cool. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, haven't. Uh, I should try the trial. I haven't. I haven't. Oh run yeah. Jamf. I, I'm pretty sure I, they're not a like active current sponsor, but I'm pretty sure uh, Jamf.com/mgg gets you your uh, your free, um, you know, free three devices for free for life. So no reason not to. We always list those, by the way, active sponsors, and I try to go through it about once a month at least. To make sure that, you know, we're keeping it up to date. But if you go to uh, MacGeekGab.com slash sponsors, not only does it list the sponsors from all the recent episodes, but right at the top, it kind of lists some of the highlights that that still exist, even even for, you know, people whose, you know, sponsorship runs had expired or, you know, whatever. We try to try to maintain all that if there's good deals for you folks. So check that out. And I'm really excited, John, because uh, for the last 10 months, I've been using a tool to record Mac Geek Gab, or as part of the recording of Mac Geek Gab, that uh, that I couldn't talk about, and now I can. It's called Farago, F-A-R-R-A-G-O, from Rogue Amoeba. It's the thing that I use to trigger all the sound effects and stuff now. I used to have to fight with, like, doing those inside of, you know, like an Evernote file, or I was doing them with QuickTime for a while, and I had Yojimbo for a while, but none of those was really built to be, like, a soundboard. And so this now is totally my soundboard and I can just like trigger things with key presses and it makes life easy to bring in things like the theme music and to jump from the theme music to the outro to the, you know, all of that. It's really good. I like it. Very excited about this. So 
Uh, yeah. Uh, we talked about how to reach us. Uh, we did talk about our premium sponsorship or premium membership program. If you are a member of that, uh, you get a special email address to use, and that's premium at MacGeekGab.com. And this, folks, yes, was one of those weeks where uh, only the premium stuff got uh, got addressed before the show. The rest will get answered because it's how we roll here. But uh, but we do prioritize you folks uh, on the premium side. So thank you to all of you. And then uh, you can call us at 224-888-GEEK. Uh, anybody can call us. Uh, and if your phone won't translate what geek is, John will do it for you because John Geek is... 4335. Five. We had lots of great questions and tips, in fact, from our Facebook group. So hopefully that shows the value over there. Visit MacGeekGab.com slash Facebook, as I said earlier, and uh, and you can join us there, too. It, I got to be perfectly honest. I, I I cringe every week when I, when I recommend that uh, because I know that it could be better if we hosted our own uh, sort of purpose-built discussion forum like the facebook discussion forum is the best of sort of the the, the gen- generic ones that are out there for a community but we have been working behind the scenes to create something that that would work even better so that we could have some indexes so that you know you could search and find questions and answers that have been discussed before and and that sort of thing so so with that may be coming not that we would tell you you have to abandon the facebook group obviously whatever happens there is great but uh but we are talking about you know some enhancements internally to to, to give us a, a more purpose-built community or home or whatever you want but for now and perhaps forever uh macgeekup.com slash facebook i want to thank everybody at cashfly c-a-c-h-e-f-l-y.com for providing all the bandwidth to get this show uh and all of our media files from us to you and of course, our ongoing sponsors in the podcast marketplace, which you can find out about it, macgeekgab.com slash sponsors, smile at smilesoftware.com, OWC at maxhales.com, barebones software at barebones.com. Uh, we have RoboForm at roboform.com slash MGG as well in there. It's all great stuff. It's good. Really, really happy with, uh, with the folks that we have. It's great. Very fortunate. You know, John, it's it's always a community here. So I know sometimes you say it and sometimes I say it. And sometimes Pete says it, but but sometimes I feel like it should be said by many voices simultaneously. Don't get cold. Don't get cold. Don't get cold. Don't get cold.